tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. All about nutrition from your favorite dietitian. Everything you need to digest in your mind. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Tips, tips, tips with Tony. Making you healthier one bite at a time. With Tony, with Tony, with Tony. Hello and welcome to the Tips with Tony podcast. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time. I am so excited for so many reasons. One, I'm recording this intro in my brand new apartment. I officially have moved from a one bedroom, really, really tight, tiny old space that I've been living in for the past five-ish years to a brand new, literally brand spanking new, no one's ever lived here before, three bedroom apartment. Um, it's amazing. It has all the amenities and there's a rooftop and there's a gym and there's like this really cute lobby area and like a workstation. I'm just like so excited. Currently I'm recording this in my office. So <laughs> I officially no longer have just an office that was in my bedroom, which is also my living room. It is literally one space just for recording. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm looking at my new view. Um, they're actually uh, building another apartment building across the street so the view is construction it's not as gorgeous as I <laughs> initially anticipated in getting but I needed to pick this location it was absolutely amazing um, if you hear an echo I am sorry if you hear Joey and Chloe in the background I'm sorry my cats if you don't know who Joey, if you don't know who Joey and Chloe are and you're new to the podcast uh, Joey and Chloe are my cats they meow a lot they um, have been meowing all day because they're still adjusting Chloe's a little bit more I would say brave, I guess. She's been really um, excited. She was a little timid at first, but she was probably the first one to really be out there um, and like is okay. Joey, on the other hand, my boy cat, their brother and sister, Joey is still having a little bit of a hard time. Um, and he's always been a little bit of, I, I knew what the definition of a scaredy cat was once I met Joey. Um, so he's a little bit more timid. He's kind of still exploring, hiding in corners. Um, so we won't hear a peep from him because he's super nervous. But meanwhile, he's the one that's usually the loud talker. So once we start hearing from him, it's actually a really good sign. What I'm about to share with you is a recording. Um, that I did with my friend Mel. She is a podcast host of Unpacking Stories. And I just took a clip of it. It's actually a really long interview. If you want to go follow Mel on Instagram, I put the link in the show notes. Um, And you can listen to the full hour. And I think it's like an hour and 15 minute interview. It's actually really great. She asked a great interviewer. She asked really great questions. We went all the way deep back into my childhood to, you know, as I grew up to what I'm doing now. Um, and then everything from just like who I am as a person, which was really refreshing and nice to kind of talk about outside of just being a registered dietitian. Um, and so I, I strongly encourage you to go and listen to the full episode if you like this little clip here. So this little clip that I'm going to share you, and I just totally realized I segued into talking about my cats and talking about this. But the point is, is that when you listen to this little clip, you are going to hear my cats in the background just because they're always there. <laughs> um, so anyways, in this clip, you're going to hear and us talk about, we get open and we talk vulnerably about our childhoods and being, you know, teased at a younger age or it being identified or noticed us or shown to us, or even maybe not even shown just like this perception of that we were overweight and that wasn't okay. And we talk about all different layers to how it has affected us both um you know when we were younger but then also as we got older and even how it can still kind of show up today so um it's a really really great clip i strongly advise that you listen to the full um thing of it and then go and listen to the full episode because there's just so much great information but i decided to just take this little clip because it's super super powerful all right so without further ado here's an interview with mel from unpacking stories enjoy Hello and welcome to another episode of Unpacking Stories. What the heck is up, friends? My name is Mel and I am so stoked to introduce this week's storyteller. Drum roll, please. I was actually supposed to have a drum roll 
uh, sound effects and I forgot to pull it up, but da -da 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 -da. Tony Marinucci. Tony is a fellow podcaster of the Tips with Tony podcast, registered dietitian, health and wellness coach whose passion is to help people live happier and healthier lives. Tony takes us through some of the happiest moments growing up on Long Island to recalling some of her darkest moments with her relationship with food. We dive into some eye-opening conversations about society, and she takes us through her process of slowing down, becoming introspective, and getting honest with herself about navigating her relationship with food and how that sort of balances out with partners. Going through her career from graduating as a registered dietitian and working many jobs thereafter, even working at a place she thought was her dream job, life has always put her leadership skills to light and she had the realization she wanted to work for herself to help others and share her message. Drawing from her experiences, she has gone on to be the founder of Tips with Tony, which has led to much success, like achieving one of her dreams and conquering her fears of stepping onto a TEDx talk stage. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to talk with her, and I just wanted to add that we do talk about eating disorders, body image, and appearance in this episode. You can find Tony on Instagram at tips underscore with underscore Tony or at her website, tipswithtony.com. Her TEDx talk and all of her info will be available down below, as well as all of the info for the podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe. Comment if you're enjoying these episodes. It means so much. And without further ado, here's Tony. Tony, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so honored to have a chance to sit and talk with you about your story. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited. Your story is one that, um, from the bit I know, holds so much motivation and really um, relatability. You are one of the few people that I've actually seen online talk about healthy relationship with both food or like nutrition and exercise, but from such a unique perspective. And I don't know if I actually can pinpoint what that is, but from what I've seen, it's like you really break down and get to the core of why someone has... I guess the ideas they do when it comes to their relationship with food and exercise. Um, and I just think it's super fascinating. Again, I don't actually know how to pinpoint what that is. I just like how you take a different approach to your work, taking into account the emotional and also psychological habits that someone may develop probably from when they were really young. Um, and truly, I can see what you, you love to do what you're doing. Thank you so much. It's so, you know, I appreciate that. And, you know, Fortunately, I'm not alone in my approach. It is a unique approach, but un what the unfortunate side is that we live in a society where what we call diet culture, so like this perception of what healthy actually is, is so loud that like me and my my colleagues just need to do a better job, and we're doing a good job, but we have to be louder than them, you know. So with the ha learn teaching people the understanding that being healthy doesn't mean you have to be obsessive. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, healthy is really a combination of your physical health and your mental health and most people often think of healthy and they just think of looking a certain way or achieving mm -hmm. a certain number on a scale and it's very damaging if you go about it that way um, so I like to kind of bring the focus back to healthy as self-care stress management overall wellness and defining what that is for you as the individual that you are rather than comparing to these unrealistic expectations that are portrayed in the media. I also want to, I'm jumping way ahead because I'm just very excited about this, but <laughs> if anyone doesn't follow Tony, you need to, because you're, I really enjoy your post on social media mm -hmm. and I can only imagine um, the people you work with get so much more out of it because I look at the stuff you say and one, you're an amazing writer. Uh, I, I think so. Thank you and so then, much. I like your posts. They're like very engaging. And usually, you know, like I will, I will admit I'm not one for long posts because I'm like so many words, you know, you yeah. have only so much attention span, but like, I really read what you say because I'm just like, oh, that's true. That's true. And so you start hitting all the truths and you're, it makes me think about myself or like, oh my gosh, I've been thinking about this this way for so long and no one's ever really pointed that out that, hey, you know, like it gets okay to start over whatever the idea is that you're talking about. But I just want to say that we'll get more into that. But um, yeah, so, okay. Let's rewind. Where did you grow up? Um, what was your childhood like? Sure. So I grew up on Long Island, New York, and my childhood was really 
fun and exciting to start, I would say. Um, I was just a really, 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 really happy kid. Um, and just, I love to dance. There was so much pure joy in my heart. And mm. I just, I have like really great memories. And then unfortunately there was a time where it was started being, it was started, it was always kind of pointed out to me that I was overweight or bigger than my peers. Mm. And it wasn't until like I was nine where I really started to like kind of internalize it. So it was there, it was present and so sad, at, you know, from like, I can remember being in kindergarten and somebody commenting on my weight, but it didn't really sit in with me where I started to identify like my weight as my worth. And I started to mm. internalize it as a very negative thing and as a bad thing. And then I started to really put limits on myself and it, you know, it only got worse into like my teenage years. I blamed mm. my weight on everything. You know, I never, I was always the tomboy, always like the guy's best friend, never the girlfriend. I was mm. always super athletic and I was always trying to make varsity as a younger age because I had the skills there. But then if I didn't get varsity on varsity, I blamed the, my, my weight or like that I couldn't have, I didn't have a fast enough mile. And the reason why I didn't have a fast enough mile was because of my weight. And so my childhood became very wrapped up about this obsession about my weight and like that my weight was just like who I was and until I was thin or skinny or accepted by society by my peers that I couldn't ever really achieve pure happiness which is so sad Um, but I also know so many people can resonate with that story so in general my childhood had happy moments you know I'm part of a Greek and Italian family where food is super abundant love is super abundant abundant um and it was beautiful but with that it's kind of you're just surrounded by this obsession with food and Mm -hmm. disordered eating behaviors were shown to me as if they were normal so like it was very off it was very normal that we would everyone on a family event would eat past the point of like where you need to unbuckle your pants full and it wasn't just on Thanksgiving like it was Sunday dinner Mm -hmm. it was Monday dinner it was Tuesday dinner it was Wednesday dinner and like that was just so normal to me and I didn't realize that it was an issue until I went to college and I had some separation um but all that to say um it was this constant battle of like eat but if you eat too much you're going to be gaining too much weight so don't eat but if you don't eat that's insulting so it was just so conflicting um and I never really knew what to do so as much as I had like these happy moments there were definitely a lot of dark moments um and I took trying to lose weight to the extreme which led to some really really dark places Mm -hmm. um it became an obsession, to be honest. I can definitely resonate with a lot of what you're saying, especially with the cultural perspective of like you eat and you eat and you eat. And like, I remember in my household, we grew up with this mentality is like, we're so grateful to have what we have. And so that's always ingrained in my mind. It's like, I have to eat all my groceries. Like I cannot let anything go to waste. And like, we used to have to eat until like our plates were empty and stuff like that, which I know I still struggle with the like overeating, I guess I should mm-hmm. say, where I'm like, I'm full, but there's still like food on my plate. And even if I could save it, I'm just like, I have this mentality. So I completely understand where that's coming from. And um, thank you for being vulnerable and open with even the dark parts because uh, there is there's a lot of love and you know that can also have a a balance with also things that you internalize after. And so, who would you say you were as a young person? How did that? How did all that? I guess sort of sort of shape who you are. Mm. Well, so you like any story, there's many layers and it can get kind of complex. But I will just say that even though it was pointed out to me at a young age that I needed to change my body or I should change my body. Um, I always put on a happy face. And so growing up, I've, I've shared the story before on my own platforms and on other podcasts. I mean, I think it's important and it's not technically my story to tell because it's about kind of the dynamic of the family growing up, but I can just tell my perspective. So mm-hmm. Growing up, you know, my sister struggled a lot. She was two years younger than me. She struggled a lot with um, her mental health. And there was a lot of um, chaos in the home. And kind of the center focus was all about, like, how do we help her? And so although I had these body image issues and I knew that my relationship with food was distorted and I was restricting my intake and then binging and then feeling guilty after and then, you know, having this desire to get it out. And so I would exercise excessively. And it was just such a vicious cycle 
I never really thought that it was like enough to get help or it mattered enough because I was constantly comparing, well, like, you know what, we need to just like put the fire out with what's going on with my sister. And like, you know, like my responsibility is to be the older sister, to be the responsible one, you know, to be the leader. And I always kind of took those leadership roles. Like I was always the coach of my sports teams. I was in this, uh, a peer group called peers as leaders. Like, I think I was just like always a natural leader. Mm -hmm. Um, but with that came this like responsibility and this limiting belief that if I'm a leader, I can't somehow have issues or problems or they're not, they wouldn't make sense. Like they're not big enough for me to get help. So unfortunately is like when you have something that goes untreated, it only gets worse. Right. So Mm -hmm the disordered eating behaviors, the obsession with food, it just got bigger. And it's funny because I went to school to become a registered dietitian and I decided like I wanted to learn like the good way of eating, but I'm not going to lie that in college, learning more about nutrition, I think only fed to the obsession. And so I tried literally everything from vegetarianism to veganism to where I like only eight whole grain. I like made up my own things. Like I just became like so obsessed mm-hmm. with nutrition and I loved it, but it was like, as much as I loved it, I definitely hid behind that a little bit and kind of masked a lot of my issues. Um, until finally I realized like, okay, this is like, this is not okay. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like if I had a client that was describing their food obsession, um, the way that I, that I was like, I this is not acceptable. So I, I then realized, okay, I need to get some help. And so I would, I went to therapy and I'm um, actually at some point in my a few times in my journey, I actually hired my own dietitian. Um, and it was great because I, I got to really heal my relationship with food and realize that, you know, restrictions, not the answer is actually part of the problem. The fact that you recognize that and you like, I don't know. Did you recognize that when you were younger or you meant like as you were older, you started recognizing? As I was old. I mean, I was always very introspective. So Mm -hmm. as a kid, I journaled, I literally had journals since I was six. I'll never forget. You still have them? I'm green. I have a few, but not the ones. Actually, I don't know. I might still have the one when I was six, but it was honestly like, this boy liked me or whatever. Like it wasn't anything. (laughs) Um, But I mean, my teenage years, the body image stuff, I wrote Mm -hmm. really dark poems it's actually going into my very first book that I'm writing I'm gonna Mm. put like a section of my um sorry my cat is crying can you hear a cat here yes (laughs) he is so extra today (laughs) he's like I want to tell my story (laughs) okay we press record it's like he knows sorry it's so distracting no that's okay I love it um the journal entries started to become like I was like screaming for help but I didn't Mm. even notice it Cause it was, it was so bizarre. Like I wrote a poem that was so dark for my English assignment. And of course my teacher's not going to ignore it. Like she wrote, please see me. And she sent me to the guidance counselor. Oh, and no. so like, it was always being addressed, but I would always, always turn it on its head about like, I guess a baby part of me was afraid to go there. So I would always turn it about, like, it was all about, you know, my family and that I'm not the one who needs the help. Like my sister does. And like, mm-hmm. it was just like, I kind of just got used to that. So when people asked me how I was, I never answered. I would just start talking about my family. Oh, you know, so I would start to kind of run from like what I needed. So as much as I had this awareness, I, I just had this idea that I needed to figure out on my own through like journaling, through writing, um, but obviously that didn't really help in the long run. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's interesting that, you know, that you would take that approach to say, like, instead of saying how you feel, you would just start talking about your family. You mentioned that studying being a registered dietitian fed into that idea you had. Why do you think that is? To be honest, a mm-hmm. lot of people who go to school to become registered dietitians are just figuring out how can I help me? Wow. Like, or they struggled with an eating disorder themselves, or they, you know, maybe they have a story. But honestly, it's eating disorders are super common in the registered dietitian community. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, I guess it's like they struggled and they want to know how to help. I mean, I think about therapy is very similar. A lot of people who go become therapists, you know, struggled with anxiety or depression when they were younger or whatever. So like that played a big pivotal, pivotal role. But I mean, I think it's just, I mean, it's a very competitive field. Um, so it's, it's a demanding, it's a lot of science, you know, it takes a minimum of five years to get your, 
your art, your credentials and you could go to school for four years as an undergraduate as for a dietetics major. Mm-hmm. But unless you got accepted to your internship, you could graduate and never be, never be eligible to sit for the registered dietitian exam. So you can't just like do the five years and like whatever grade you get, you're an RD. Like you have to, you know, get a pretty good like GPA, good average. You have to be involved in extracurriculars. So there's just a lot of expectations and I don't know, to be honest, I don't know if, I mean, there was, for me, it was, I guess, because I internalized thinking my weight mattered. And so Mm -hmm. for me, I felt like I needed to lose weight to be respected as an RD. And to be honest, we live in a fat phobic society. So that's actually not too far off. Mm -hmm. Um, But that doesn't mean I need to play to societal norms. Like I realize that now, but Mm -hmm. when you're like 18 years old, I think you're just always trying to impress other people and you're just living by you know, other things. So, you know, when you get older, you get wiser, you get more mature, you start to recognize that like other people's opinion of you does not even matter. Like the most important opinion is yourself (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and knowing that you're being true to yourself. Everything you're saying is just bringing back all these memories of just like little things, right? Like society. So at one point in my life, I worked at Hollister when I was in college, Um, you know, and that's a huge, like how you look and even like, I never thought I looked good enough. I didn't understand why I w- I just needed a job. So I was applying everywhere and they hired me. And of course I always got those like remarks. I never see myself like that. And you know, I still struggle with that. And um, it's weird for me to feel like I have to be vulnerable, but I have to, cause I'm, you know, I, I like doing these kinds of things and this is like, um, helping me a lot. I hope that doesn't sound like selfish to like talk about. No, definitely, definitely. But I remember when I was little and I was kind of like struggling in my head if I should share this, but I remember being little and I was like going to the bathroom and I want to say I was like probably like seven or so. Um, and I think that was the first time when I sat down that I like held my belly fat and I was like, oh, I'll never be able to lose this because it's like my, you know, quote unquote baby fat as what like we're just told. Yeah. And so yeah, I've never shared that, but you saying all that, I'm like, wow, I didn't realize like little things that I had no idea at the time. Those were so true to like probably what I've seen and like what I'm just like told, even offhanded comments mm-hmm. about that and like the society aspect. But yeah, so thank, thank you for sharing that. That's, you know, unfortunately, it's very true that like it happens so early on. So we have to be really careful, not only the way that we talk to ourselves, but the way that we talk about ourselves in front of children. Um, and especially the way that we talk to children. Um, and I'm sorry that you weren't protected at that time. And neither was I like, you know, but you, we have to learn from it and just, mm-hmm. you know, you know, be aware of it for the younger generations. Cause if we don't do anything about it, it's just going to keep getting passed on. It's so true. And I don't I like I again, it's just like a passing thought because like no one ever said anything because, you know, or at least not what I thought, probably because they didn't think about it, didn't want to hurt me. I don't know. But um, yeah, I just think that's uh, that's very interesting. And thank you for sharing all your moments. Were there any other moments in school, you know, that had to do with this or any other part of your life that were pivotal, maybe shaped who you are now or you look back and you're like, wow, the dots are like connecting. I mean, there's really so many. I mean, the thing that I probably think that makes the most sense of like where I'm at today and where I was was um, like, like I was sharing earlier, I believe that until I lost weight, like I wasn't worthy of love. I, you know, men, boys weren't going to pay attention to me as I got older. Like I was like never, I was never in a relationship. And so I had this perception that like I needed to lose weight in order to fall in love or to be loved and all that. And I share this in my Ted talk. And I also talk about it in my book about, you know, my very first like few weeks of college And I had this decision that I thought being a vegetarian was going to be like the healthy way and how I was going to lose weight. And of course, on the outside, I told people like, oh, the vegetarian diet is a very healthy diet and all that. But another side note, just so you know, a lot of people who struggle with disorder eating or eating disorders hide behind it through vegetarianism and veganism. It's not to say every vegetarian and vegan Mm -hmm. um, has an eating disorder or struggling with disordered eating. It's just super, super common. And in my case, that was the case. Um, and so I say that to say that I had like made this big transition. I decided that I was going to be a vegetarian. I was in new school. I didn't know anybody. Like I was like, all right, this is my shot to lose the weight, to prove myself. The very first person that gave me attention, the very first 
man in my entire life that noticed me for me and pursued me and asked me for my phone number became my boyfriend. And I'm not to say that we didn't have a very healthy relationship. It was actually a great relationship, but I never dated around. I never like considered the source of the attention. I was just like, mm. oh my God, somebody likes me. Like, let me date them. And he and yeah. it ended up being great, but I, it wasn't until like our almost being together for three years that I realized like I could potentially like live the rest of my life with this guy and we can get married because my old mindset was like, oh, he's the only person who's ever liked me or ever like mm. me at my size. Mm. But the reality is, is that like he, he was great for what he was in that moment. He helped me learn, we grew, but mm. that he wasn't my forever guy and that's okay. And you can be with a good person and that doesn't mean you need to marry them. Right. And so I say that to say, because what happens with dieting and it's what I talk about today and what I really started to recognize is people get so hooked on one way of eating, whether it's a diet or a lifestyle change that they stick to and they believe is like maybe it did help them lose 10 to 20 pounds but now they're fearful of doing anything else and so they become so clinged and so attached to this one way of eating that they become blind to all the reasons why maybe it's not working for them and although Mm. it's good it's not great and that there's something better and you're maybe making these sacrifices that you don't need to be making and you're kind of miserable if you really get down to it like if you're not super happy like you're pretty miserable like I don't really think there's an in-between I think Mm -hmm. you're either living like a very abundant joyous life or you're not happy like (laughs) so, so like if you're settling for something that's like mediocre to me, like, that's not what we're here for. And so um, I think it was like, in that moment, what I realized it was like, I was gonna, I went for a walk. And I was like, okay, I can continue to pretend that this is the person I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with, because he's accepted me for me at all body sizes, when I was overweight, when I was lost the weight, when I gained some whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, or I can like, go with my gut that's telling me that there's your there's more out there for you you need to explore more and you need to do it on your own um, and you need to trust that and there's no coincidence that as I did that I stopped being a vegetarian I stopped like playing to these roles or these rules that I thought I needed to be in in order to be happy Mm. um so it's kind of complex (laughs) I hope that that made sense (laughs) yes yes it is um but um it's just it's just really interesting how we think we're doing one thing that's like for our nutrition, but it's affecting so many other areas in our life. With your relationship along with um, school, once you graduated or you completed, what was your journey like after that? My journey took me into, I became a registered dietitian. Um, I mean, definitely dated not the best men in between. Um, really not great fits. Um, I think I still even though I was growing and changing, there was just this really big part of me that still just had this limiting belief that I needed to settle. Like, I think it goes back to, that's the thing. It's not all about nutrition. Like it just goes back to like the role that I played, you know, in my childhood as being the leader, the caretaker, the peacemaker. Um, So it was like, like I had to always just keep things together. And so the people that I was getting involved in relationships with, like they, didn't have their stuff together. And I think I got comfort in knowing that I can like help them or fix them, which is just Mm -hmm. a really bad place to be because you are not responsible to fix or heal anybody. Like it's their responsibility. Um, But so like, as much as like my relationship with food was getting better and like my career was, was going forward. um, I was still like getting into these things that were still kind of holding me back. Um, But eventually I broke that pattern. And that's when I started to make the connection. It's that like, we have these patterns, both in our relationships, both in the way that we, you know, go from diet to diet and never really learn anything. Like I really needed to slow down, become introspective and really ask myself and get honest with myself. Like, why is it that I keep getting into these relationships that do not serve me and they're not good in the long run? And if someone had said that to me when I was dieting, I probably would have learned a lot. Like rather being, you know, going from vegetarianism to veganism to a gluten-free vegan to like restrict, 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 and then like excessive exerciser. And it was just like so obsessive. And if someone was like, wait a minute, like, okay, there might be parts of these diets and parts of these workouts and parts of these plans that work for you, but you don't have to do it at a thousand percent because Mm -hmm anything that you try to do like that. And then you there's no room for anything else. Like it's just going to fail. Putting that connection to a relationship is so true, right? Like you can't, 
there has to be such a balance and everyone has to bring a hundred percent of them of themselves. Yeah. But like, you can't be with the person that you have to overly fix, especially if they're not willing to fix themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's always taking from one part or another. And the fact that you sort of figured it out, you know, along the way, like that's pretty incredible as well. It took time, took a lot of therapy, but I did it. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of journal writing. Mm -hmm. Um, Till this day, I write in my journal every day. That's awesome. So you graduated, you became a registered dietitian. Mm -hmm. Did you go, I actually don't know what the next steps are. Do you look for a job at a place? I I don't know anything. Yeah. To become a a dietitian, it takes five years. They recently, I think it was 2020 or 2023. I think it's maybe 2023. They're making you get your master's degree with it. Um, you don't necessarily have to, I did it now, now you'll have to before when I was going to school, you didn't have to. Um, but I chose to do a dietetic internship plus my master's in one year. So I was pretty crazy, but in, so my fifth year I got my master's degree and I became a registered dietitian. Um, from there, I actually worked in an outpatient facility for those who struggled with, um, you know, their body image or disordered eating habits and eating disorder behaviors. And so I actually got like my dream job right off the bat, which I thought was going to be my dream job. It was literally in my hometown. I didn't, I could literally walk to work. It was with somebody who's had, who's been a dietitian for years and is super respected. And most people as a registered dietitian, when they graduate, they often go into clinicals. So they go into like a hospital setting or a a long-term care facility Um, which I enjoyed and I liked, but, you know, having my own private practice was always something that I wanted. Helping people that struggled the way that I struggled um, was always something that I wanted. And I got that like first job, like literally I was interning before I became an RD with, with her. Um, And I thought it was like going to be it. I thought that was like what I was going to do, but like anything, I think if you really, you know, want it to be yours, um, you know, I'm not to disrespect. She taught me a lot, but it was Mm -hmm. very clear that I would always be working for her. And Mm. I just didn't like that controlling demeanor. As I got good at what I was doing, I got talked down to, it was like, I could be good, but I couldn't be too good. Cause if I surpassed her skills, you know, anyways, yeah, I, to say, I left <laughs> your leadership side came out. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I was like, <laughs> um, so I left. So I ended up going, I became, oh my God, I did everything like any where you can put a registered dietitian. I did it. So I worked, I managed the kitchens in hospitals. So I managed the employees in the kitchens and hospitals. I worked as a clinical dietitian. I basically was that person who just helped out on any unit from oncology to the burn unit, to the vet unit, to the ICU. Mm-hmm. So like I saw it all. I worked at a daycare facility called Head Start uh, for low income children. I helped kind of um, create the menus for those children um, so that making sure they were eating nutrient nutriently nutritionally balanced um, and also catering to those who had allergies. I worked in long term care facilities. So for the elderly. Um, oh, my God. What else did I do? I, I literally worked like for anywhere you can put an RD like I, I did it. Um, And I would always have like multiple jobs. So I would always be working like, oh, my last one was the best one was I worked for a supermarket, which was so much fun. Um, So I got to do like store tours and I got to do cooking demos and I got to do community events and I got to do counseling. I had my own office. It was literally the best job. And I remember being like, okay, this is amazing. This is everything I want to do. But once again, I'm working for somebody else. Mm. Like I've always wanted to work for myself. So I started my own business on the side while working for that company. They were very respectful. Um, I kind of grew it. And then I was like, I was like, okay, I could, you know, keep doing this as a side hustle and never really allowing myself to expand. Like the t- I've had a podcast for going on like three or four years. I think my, my podcast is, yeah, I love it. Um, my podcast is almost three years old. I was a co-host to another podcast um, about a year before that. So I've been podcasting for like four years. At that point, it was like a few years and I was like, okay, I could like take this. I have the platform. I had the social media presence. My, my Tips with Tony page has been since college. Like, So I was like, okay, like I can keep working for somebody else and doing this on the side or like I could work and run my own business. So that's basically what I do now. I do online nutrition coaching where I help people very similar to where I struggled, who have these obsessive thoughts around food, um, 
who aren't quite sure which direction to go if they want to lose weight, um, if they're trying to just heal any ailments, like maybe they were told they were borderline diabetic or they have high cholesterol or high blood pressure. Mm. Um, But mostly those who struggle with this obsession over food and they get lost in overwhelm and they either are super restrictive or they're binging or purging, not always purging, but like sometimes purging comes in many forms. So I will say it does not what people perceive, but it could be excessive exercise. It could be extreme restriction. Um, it could be just doing like a cleanse or a detox and I'm putting that in, in air quotes because you actually don't need that. Your body naturally does that for you. So it's just like anybody that struggles with that cycle, those are the people that I help with um, one-to-one right now. Oh, and can I say, I didn't know there were so many jobs a registered dietitian could do, actually. (laughs) So you're naming off like schools and hospitals and, you know, um, care facilities of all kinds. And I was like, I had no idea. I just thought people there did it. I don't know. I guess I never really paid attention to how much. And the supermarket, that's really awesome. Yeah, that one was my favorite. Did you get to decide what you wanted to demo while you were there? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, they would always, you know, there was like any like vendors that would, you know, oh, like, oh, dietitian, like promote my product, do this. And so I would kind of just weigh the pros and cons of it. Like if I believed in it, then I would demo it. But I was never forced to do anything that I didn't, that I didn't, I wasn't aligned with like what I you know, enjoyed or what I perceived to be healthy. Cause there's a lot of things that like a lot of people abuse, just put organic on something. They're like, Oh, that's healthy. And like, that's actually not true. Yeah. Um, so, um, I like, you know, so I make sure that it's something that is aligned with, um, you know, something that I would normally promote whether they were asking me to or not. That's awesome that, you know, a company or a store would give you that much freedom, I guess, to be able to decide those things. Is it common for a lot of supermarkets to have a registered dietitian on their and under them in their company? So it's more common than it's been. Um, I think COVID unfortunately made things shift a bit, but um, it was becoming more and more popular. I will say the company that I worked for did an excellent job because like it, there's a lot of supermarkets that might have an RD just do the cooking demos or just do, you know, um, kind of like a, an approval stamp on like some products like dietitian approved or whatnot. But there's very, I don't know of many that basically what the company paid me a salary and then my one-on-one nutrition services and counseling were completely free to anybody that shopped at the store. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it, so it's popular. Um, the way in which my company did it, I don't know if they, like, there's many that do it like that. I'm very mm-hmm. fond of it. Um, but unfortunately with COVID, um, I don't think that's happening so much anymore. I think that's a good tip, though, for anybody who never knew that you could potentially, you know, see a registered dietitian um, through maybe a local supermarket. Check, check, because you never know. Yeah, that's, I had no idea. I'm like, I'm yeah. learning so much today. I'm yeah. going to so much knowledge. So you mentioned your business. Congratulations for stepping out. That must have been a huge decision and probably not an easy one. What do you think your, I guess, toughest challenge you've had to overcome has been with your business so far? So it's been probably more recent, and I'll just be really honest and really vulnerable about what's been like going on. It's just mm-hmm. for me, I've actually been very successful. I've grown my business to this point where I actually need to hire other RDs because otherwise oh. I will burn myself out <laughs> to oblivion. <laughs> like I am very, um, and this is not my personality, so this is when you know you need to delegate. So I have been grateful and blessed, but also super anxious and feeling Mm. like I have to say yes to everything. And I have, um, like, there's there's just no space, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that if you really want to make an impact in this world and you really want to grow, you have to let go. And so I'm learning now that if I really want my vision to change the way, like to be louder than the diet industry and to be louder than diet culture, then I'm going to need to let other people do my job. (laughs) I'm going to have to like let go. And so it's hard because when you, you know, right now I'm going into it, it'll be actually, I think I left my full-time job like two years ago today. Um, Second or the third. Yeah. We're recording this on February 3rd. So, um, so it's been two years. And so in this two years, it's amazing what I've been able to accomplish. And I'm so grateful and so proud. Um, At the same time, I'm at this point where I need to like chill. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's hard. It's hard to let go of something that you're so proud of and to give somebody else 
kind of the reins a little bit. Um, but if I want quality of life and balance, which I preach to my clients, mm-hmm. then I, I need to let go. Otherwise I will burnt out. I will be burnt out and then there's no business and that's not fair. Yeah, no, for sure. And like allowing someone to help you is also a big thing because it's almost like, are they going to do it like I do it? Like, you know, it's like finding that right person. How's your journey been so far with potentially finding someone? I hired a business coach to help me because I knew I was like on this level of burnout and yeah. direction. Um, and so we just talked about it, like literally like not even a week ago. So oh I basically am in the process of creating like the job description. I'm going to put it on Indeed. I'm going to talk about it on my, you know, on my Instagram. I'm going to talk about it on my podcast and like, get it out there. But first I need to just create that stuff. But, um, soon I'm going to start promoting that I'm hiring and then I'm going to have to start the vetting process. Um, which is like sad too, because then you don't want to tell people no, but I need yeah. to also really interview people because this is the future of my business. And so I can't just like let someone in because I'm afraid of hurting their feelings. Like, right. <laughs> so, you know, it really, it really challenges you. Yeah, for sure. Congratulations, by the way, to be at this point where, and especially 2020, not an easy year, as hard as it is, be like, okay, I can allow someone else. Like, I, I have the, I have the means to expand, mm-hmm. you know, the growing pains, as they call it. What advice can you give to anyone that's starting out, maybe a business in general, or something along the lines of what you are doing? If you are starting a business, definitely hire a coach. If you don't have the funds to hire a coach, just ask a ton of questions. You can message me. How did you get started? I will say right now, especially with the pandemic and everyone being online, your best bet is to get really, really uncomfortable to get comfortable. So get really uncomfortable showing your showing your face on social media, going on stories, talking about yourself before you talk about what you offer. Because people Mm. don't buy things, they buy into you. They like you, right? There's many people that if you're selling lotion, sell lotion. Mm -hmm. What's going to make that person buy it is knowing who you are, knowing the story behind it, right? And giving Mm -hmm. out a ton of free advice before you could ever make a profit. Like I've been blogging for 10 years because I love it and I'm passionate about it. And I didn't start my business until, like I said, it was three years ago. It was a side hustle. Two years, it's been full time. So you can't just expect and also too the clients didn't just roll in even though yeah. Yeah, now I have my LLC open for business like it doesn't yeah. work that way. wouldn't it right? be nice if it did right it would be great but before you could even like expect that you know there's an, another coach once said to me take action without expectation and I honestly think that's the best like sort of advice I've ever gotten is because if you're always kind of expecting then you're just, uh, it's just like not a good place to be. So make sure you choose something that you're really passionate about and that you would love to do, whether you made money or not. But then at the same point, if you're at that point where you want to start making money, make sure you're showing up and give out your best content for free. Like Mm -hmm. I don't sugarcoat anything. Obviously I, cause I know when people work with me one-on-one, they're getting the best of the best just because like, there's no, there's nothing, you know, information is one thing, but having a strategy and how to apply it and that connection and that 30 minutes of, you know, closed off focus and attention just between me and and me and my client, like you there, you can't put a price tag on that. Like that's really life changing for them, but just for the, the education stuff that I teach them, that I, I put that on social media. What am I hiding it for? Mm-hmm. Like, it's only going to help people. Um, and, you know, hopefully it connects and it resonates. And I know that not everybody either is, you know, wants to, um, not everybody is maybe like ready or wants to work with a professional. Although I do believe in the extreme benefits of hiring help. Like there are, the answers are out there. You just have to make sure you're going to the right resource. Do you keep up with your clients after they've graduated, I guess we could say, or do you see, I guess, what's the pattern post that? I mean, everyone's story is kind of different. Do you Mm -hmm. see that they continue on with what you have helped them with, or does it sort of like maybe fall apart? Well, I would hope not. I mean, I don't know. I do keep in touch and anyone I've kept in touch with tells me positive things. Um, I think because here's the reason why the minimum amount of time to work with me is six months. Most people work with me longer than that. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to commit to six months. And to be honest, those who don't come back, 
you know, I'm not, I don't like how people sign contracts and I'm like, you don't have to commit. It's just this understanding that if you want real change, you need at least six months together. And I've had people that stop for whatever financial reasons or whatever it is, mm-hmm. and they always come back. So I'm just letting you know, like, if you really want real change you have, and you're working on your habits and your mindset, you need a minimum six months with a nutrition professional. And so because we spend six months together and it's not just our calls that we have, right? So in between our calls, my clients take photos of their food. Um, so that's a touch point with me so I can see what they're eating. And they, if they have questions about it, they can, you know, they know I'm watching. So it's like an accountability factor. Mm-hmm. They have the ability to message me in between client calls. So that way they, if they have a question, they don't have to wait a week to, to add an answer. Like they can just ask me. So if like they have that, we created this whole plan on like how they were going to navigate you know, take out fry, like pizza on Friday with their family and other families like, you know what, we want Chinese food. They don't need to like freak out about it. They can just message me and be like, hey, this is what happened. Like, do you think I should go with this or that? And then I kind of help guide them through it. And we also have group support. So with my one-on-one clients, I also have a um, where they ever all get together once a month and just kind of share so they can hear from people who, you know, maybe they just joined the program, but then someone who's been with me for six or seven months kind of talks about, um, you know, where they're at. And so then rather than in the beginning, when anything's new, you have a lot of doubt, a lot of worry, a lot of fear, mm-hmm. a lot of anxiety, you know, it's really scary because in, what we're doing together is creating real change. It's no longer a fluffy fix. It's no longer, you know, something that you found on the internet and you just do it for a week and then you stop doing it. Like it's mm-hmm. literally challenging you and making sure that you're ready to just allow like the real you to come out. And that's scary because we've been told to hide behind our, so many things for so long. So, but it's nice to be in a group of people who, you know, are where we're are like who are where you weren't where you are basically, or who I guess who got in the head <laughs> a little bit. That's like wordy. Um, but basically to see that like, okay, if I just trust this process and I hold on for a little bit longer, like I'll be good. Um, and then I think because of my social media presence, they're also getting that support as well. Mm-hmm. And those who continuously follow me after they're still in my, um, like free, I have a free Facebook support group. They're still involved in that. They still follow me on social media and I watch their journeys and they comment and they share and they're, it's so awesome because it's their, you can tell like their whole mindset and their whole view of food and their, and their bodies and working out and all that stuff, um, is like completely changed. So that's a really spe- special relationship. Sorry, I can't words. Um, that's <laughs> a really words. special relationship you have with them. And I guess in a way, it's kind of like that. I, I keep seeing these factors of like the leadership from when you were, you say, like younger. And like as you've grown is like, yeah, a leader cares about the people that they're like, quote unquote, leading or helping or guiding. And it seems like your natural instinct is to do that. So the fact that you keep tabs and you're not just like, all right, six months, uh, like, see you later. Good luck. You know, like they still have the resources to, to um, go back to or reach out to you. And it's not like they have to schedule or like make a whole big thing about it. And it's interesting because six months, like they say it's what 21 days for a habit, correct? But six months is like, is way surpassing that. Well, and that's another thing too. Real research actually shows it takes 66 days to make or break a habit. Um, And so that's like three months or, or a little bit more over three months. Um, but you have to remember that when you're, when if you're really thinking about health, the way that I described it in the beginning of the recording, which is taking into account your physical health and your mental health, mm-hmm. then there's many habits within that, right? There's right. sleep, there's hydration, there's stress management, there's quality of food, there is exercise, there's um, recovery and like making sure you're resting and restoring. There's um, your relationship with food, managing binging and emotional eating. Like there are so many layers Mm -hmm. and there's so many habits that really need to kind of take place in order for you to be successful in the long run, which is why it's a lot longer than most people think. I I like how you said breaking down habits as opposed to, I said like building habits, right? 21 days to build, but like, so, but you're like, no, there's habits to break down. Yeah, definitely. You have to unlearn a lot of this stuff first before we can relearn some healthy, healthier behaviors. What has been your most um, exciting part or um, your favorite memory of your journey, either with your business or just with your life so far? Ah, I don't know. 
I mean, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was my TED Talk, which was about almost a year ago. And I think that was really powerful for me because it challenged me. It actually scared me. Whereas mm. like a lot of the other stuff I did, even going full time, like there was fear there, but I was just so like, I'm making this work. Like I was just so confident, but I think with the Ted talk, I, I think I did this. I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, you know, I started, I was more focused on the outcome than the fact of being proud for me doing it. So, and this is similar as me as, as I'm writing my book, I got very caught up in like, it needs to be the best book ever. And like, I got really caught up in this needs to be the best talk ever. And so when you get caught up in it needs to be the best ever, you Mm -hmm. are frozen. Like you're literally like, you're just, you're stuck in fear because you almost feel like no matter what you do, it's never going to be good enough. And so with the Ted talk, I knew it was a big deal. It is a pretty big deal. They give a Ted talk. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But I like psyched myself out. And so when it actually happened and I realized I just needed to just like, just trust that I prepared the best that I could just step on that stage and just talk and deliver. Mm -hmm. And I, and I did that and I came through with it. I felt so good and so confident and so clear, Mm -hmm. but it had nothing to do with the reactions, the views, the, you know, although I had an amazing support system and those who watched lives and shared it and all that, it was so nice, but it was really more about like, holy crap. Like I was so afraid. I was so scared, but I did it. And I'm proud because I did it. it I could have, I could have screwed up. There was one point I did screw up. I don't think anybody noticed, but like, it was just something that I was really afraid of and I did it anyway. And I do talk about that a lot. Like a lot of people are waiting to be ready to do something, but you're never really going to be a hundred percent ready. Like the circumstances are never going to be perfect. And honestly, real success comes from those imperfect moments and you figuring it out, you know? So I think that just like represented just so much of my journey and just so much of what I, I realize like so many people do feel, feel, which is that fear. Um, and it just reminded me, like, I need to continue to step into my power and, you know, I can be fearful, but I got to do it anyway. Um, and I think if we lived our lives more like that, like we would be living much happier lives. Well, first off, congratulations on being able to step on stage and do a TED talk and everything that followed that. It's incredible. I will link it because I want everyone to go watch it. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Can you actually talk about a little bit of your journey of how you got to that point of doing a TED talk? Is it something that you've always wanted to do or is it just something that came up about throughout you know, your journey? I think when I started exploring the idea of being an entrepreneur um maybe like four or five years ago um I started to uh listen to I never I don't I'm not like the best I'm a good reader but I do a lot of audiobooks and especially because I was had all these jobs and I was constantly in the car and I was commuting I just like read so many audiobooks anyways um I came across um, Lori Harder and it's just really, honestly, like if I think about like coming full circle, I'm actually, her husband is my, my business coach now. So Whoa. it's like so crazy. Like I just put that together. So, <laughs> That's awesome. so yeah, so I, you know, I've listened to a ton of audiobooks, and one of them that I listened to was called the tribe called bliss by Lori Harder. And I found her TED talk and it was an incredible TED talk. And then I kind of like saw her journey. She started as a personal trainer, so not a dietitian, but similar field. Mm -hmm. Um, And then she switched into more like a personal development guru. And now she kind of is like more like a business coach. And she, anyways, I watched her journey um, and I watched her like give this TED talk and, you know, kind of skyrocket from there. So um, part of it was hoping it was going to get me, just the audience and the views because I knew I had a message and I knew that was important and I knew I wanted, you know, there's, I, I, through exploring, there's more dietitians that have TED Talks than you would think. Mm. But once again, it's not very prevalent. Like we are not, a lot of RDs are in a hospital, working in a hospital. We need to be more on social media because unfortunately what you see on social media are people that have quote unquote, nice bodies. And I'm not dismissing their bodies. All bodies are nice and beautiful. So I'm not saying that they're not, but what society perceives is like, Oh, this person has abs. Oh, that must mean they know what they're talking about. And so therefore I'm going to follow them and they promote this detox tea 
and like whatever. And meanwhile, it's not helpful. There's no science behind it. It's super damaging. Um, and it's not helpful at all. So anyways, all that to say that, um, I saw the way in which like a Ted talk could really help you like gain a following, gain an audience. And I knew that I wanted that. Um, so I just started to watch them. I started to like ask questions. Um, my, actually my alma mater. So I went to Oneonta upstate New York, um, was actually hosting it. So Ted, Ted X, there's Ted mm-hmm. and then there's Ted X. Ted X is like locally run. So anybody can kind of put it on, but then it goes on the YouTube channel. So my alma mater, my college was doing it and I had applied and they actually told me no. Um, and that I was a close second and to reapply next year. And so I let like a whole year go by because I was kind of, you know, defeated about it, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, you know, my idea then wasn't my idea now, which is my book, which is like everything is just, I wasn't done learning the relationship lessons. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't even a thought to do a TED talk about the parallels between dieting, dating, and romantic, romantic relationships. And so I realized now that that was the reason why it didn't happen when I wanted it to happen. And so then I came up with this new idea. And then um, my, I had a friend who's a dietitian. He did a TED Talk. He connected me with some people who um, kind of helped him prepare for his talk and like had connections of knowing where you can apply. So I applied to literally 50 different universities. Um, they A lot of them said no. A lot of them I didn't hear from. A few said not this time, maybe next year. And then I just got my one yes. So all you need <laughs> is one yes, um, yes, and the rest is history. That's incredible, and like to keep going because you know, get it, it, it's hard to feel defeated or get told no, mm-hmm. you know. And so, kudos to you for making it onto that stage. Thank um, you. And you said something, you know, like you, what you were saying about. Um, you know, what you see online and stuff actually led me to what I wanted to sort of shift to a little bit. And it's that like working out and nutrition is one of those things that is, there's so much information, right? From different sources and, you know, quote unquote trends that become popular. One day keto is popular. One day you can't do this. You can do that. And it really becomes popular through that social media platform. How should people sort of sort out the facts from the fiction, especially if they hear from people that they may follow online that they, you know, like? Yeah, it's, you know, obviously really overwhelming and complicated and it can be really difficult to know where to start. Mm -hmm. Um, The first thing I would say is just make sure you know your resources. Like just because somebody lost weight doesn't mean that they're qualified to teach you something Mm -hmm. so if your goal is weight loss like that might be great if you want for like inspiration but there's also a lot of people that hide behind eating disorder and disordered eating habits and that are socially accepted by society and you don't see them regain the weight back because they're not putting that on their highlight reel so Mm -hmm. i will just say just be mindful of who you follow um in general i will say that there's now there's not one um diet plan out there that's effective for everybody so you need to figure out what works best for you and so although there's a lot of research and things that are conflicting there are some very fundamental things that I can almost guarantee are going to help you feel a little bit better right so staying hydrated with water there's nothing wrong wrong with water and if you hear that there's something (laughs) wrong with water don't follow that person and don't listen to them that's (laughs) weird yeah trust me I've heard everything I've heard I I believe you I'm just like I mean we live Water in a society that fruit is considered unhealthy because fruit has sugar and the sugar mm. makes you fat. All of that is BS. Okay. You can eat at any time of the day. Um, you, I want you to eat fruit, you know, getting a variety in your diet is going to be beneficial. So getting, you know, three to five servings of vegetables a day, two to three servings of fruit a day, making sure you have protein at each meal that will help with your satiety and your cravings, um, fiber rich grains. So a lot of people are fearful of carbohydrates. There's nothing wrong with carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates are a great fuel source. Um, getting your starches, whole grains, so things like quinoa, brown rice, sweet potato, like so starchy veggies like sweet potato, butternut squash, those are all great starches to incorporate. That doesn't mean you have to never have white bread or never have um, white rice or anything like that. It's just making sure that you're incorporating most of your grains are whole grain and fiber fiber dense and nutrient dense because what a lot of people look for is like the calories but so Mm -hmm. a whole grain piece of bread might have more calories than a white piece of bread 
Um, but the whole grain priest of bread is going to keep you fuller for longer. It's also going to help manage your blood sugars and, you know, reduce your uh, risk of elevated cholesterol. Um, and in general, it's just going to provide a little bit more um, bang for your buck, let's say. So it's not that you have to negate and never have things like pastries or, you know, whatever you consider as like less healthy. So like fried foods and all that stuff, you can consume those things. But if that's all that you're consuming or in like, especially like uh, processed foods, a lot of people like are fearful of those. There's nothing wrong with processed foods. There's nothing wrong with fried foods. There's nothing wrong with having sweets. It's just, if that's the majority of what you're eating, you're probably not going to feel very good. So mm -hmm. I rather just kind of get people to kind of flip it a little bit and do it slowly. So if you normally start your day where maybe you don't eat breakfast, or if you eat breakfast, it's like a piece of toast with some jelly on it, switch it to a whole grain piece of toast, maybe throw an egg on there from for some protein and have a piece of fruit with it to balance it out. So, Mm -hmm. it seems complicated but if you really just focus on like one habit at a time so maybe you know eating breakfast if you don't eat breakfast drinking more water if you don't drink water maybe taking a look at where the added sugars are coming from so not from fruit but maybe from like your frappuccino or from you know the sugar you put in your coffee or so believe it or not some cereals or yogurts even um not that that's the worst thing but just start to read labels and educate yourself and I know it's not super like fancy and it's like okay do this don't do that it really is an exploratory phase but I think like anything in life like there's roadmaps and there's guides but to just be expected to do this and don't do that like that's just not how life works you know mm -hmm. especially with your eating habits which I would hope are aligned with your lifestyle your level of commitment um your cultural background, your food preferences, um, if you have allergies or intolerances, like I can't even tell you how many people have come to me and told me that their trainer who loves, love trainers, love trainers, <laughs> my boyfriend's a trainer, but trainers are not, unless they went to school to be RDs or they went to school to get a nutrition coaching credential of some sort are not supposed to be prescribing diet plans and meal plans. And I've had so many people come to me and tell me that their trainer put them on this diet plan that has dairy and they're allergic or lactose intolerant or whatever. And they've continuously told them like, I can't eat those things. So all that to say that your nutrition plan should be reflective of your lifestyle. Your, if there's any allergies, you should not be consuming foods that you're allergic to. Yeah. Um, and it shouldn't be complicated. Mm -hmm. So one tip I give my clients that I, and I talk about it on, you know, on my podcast and platform, super simple is the plate method. And I did not create it. It's literally from, you know, um, very well known <laughs> as, as a helpful strategy, but, um, basically it's like at your gym at dinner, you don't have to negate the rice. You can have the rice, right? Um, but one thing you might want to consider doing is using the plate method. So making half of your plate vegetables, a quarter of it starch. So a quarter would be the rice and then the quarter of your, of it protein. So it could be like chicken, fish, pork, beef, whatever protein you usually have. If you're vegan or vegetarian, it could be a veggie burger or tofu or tempeh or something like that. And that way it's not that you can't have rice. It's just, if you're only having rice and you're not eating your veggies, that can be where you might not feel good overall. So it's just shifting the portions and the amounts and the frequency in which you eat certain foods that ultimately is going to accumulate over time and be the overall outcome of your health. Wow. A lot of that. I actually didn't know about the plate method. So that's ah, a very, oh, yeah, so I'm, le I'm learning so much. Like you're not even <laughs> believe I'm so silent because I'm just like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I'm like <laughs> actually taking notes and I will say water is actually one of my favorite drinks i'm like so plain it's water and coffee and yeah. there was a while where i was drinking so much coffee because i wasn't getting enough sleep then you know i i did i now i'm only one cup a day i do not allow myself more um but yeah it was it was a it was a long road for coffee and i but i'm sure i'm a, i'm a huge coffee lover so i i get that i get yeah. that but every time you know it's also it's the timing in which because it's, it's such a catch-22 right you have trouble sleeping and you're so tired during the day, so you have a cup of coffee. But if you, for me, if I have a cup of coffee, like after two, I can't fall asleep at night. Oh, okay, yeah. And so that's like, so I, yeah, it's I, I'm I'm in the same boat with you. I'm working on the 
on the one cup a day. And yeah. Like two in the morning before 12. Yeah. Because I, don't, I just can't get to the one quite yet. I hear you. I hear you. It's also what a cup is. Mine, I say a cup, but it's like really like, you know, well, oh, if yeah. you're watching, yeah. it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty big cup. It's not like a, your standard cup. I, um, I had to do that because I realized that coffee wasn't even help like, aiding me in any sort of way. I was just really drinking it purely for no reason other than that. I actually like to taste the coffee, but then I realized like if I want to like actually use it for, you know, one deliciousness, but two for what it's intended, I guess, or I don't know how you would say that, that I really needed to like actually use it when I need it. And if I depend on more than like two, three cups, I'm clearly not getting enough sleep. Right. Yeah. So I do want to just say that there's like, actually coffee is very healthy for you. It has just as many antioxidants as tea does. So like tea gets perceived as like this healthy thing and coffee is like the devil, but they're both actually really good for your health. Mm -hmm. um, the, the issue becomes the caffeine content. And right. like you just said, exactly right. There's the, the, the issue can be either the caffeine so you're obviously like masking, you're not getting to the root of the issue, like prioritizing your sleep, right? And mm -hmm. you're just putting a bandaid on things. Um, a lot of people think it's dehydrating. It's actually not dehydrating. It might make you use the bathroom more because it's diuretic. Um, so you might just need a little bit more water, but it's not as dehydrating as people think. Um, but then the other thing is like, what are you putting in your coffee and how much are you consuming? So for some people, they have basically, it's like, can I have some coffee with that milk? Like, and it's not the milk's yeah. bad, but it's like mostly milk and sugar and a splash of coffee. Yeah. And so then really it's like, you know, what are your other health goals? Like, is there elevated cholesterol in your family? Are you working on a weight management plan? Like, is there area an area where we can kind of free up some of those calories or added fat to maybe utilize in a meal? and feel mm -hmm. more satiated from it rather than drinking our calories. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's lines that it becomes obviously very individualized to the person. Um, but that's usually the things that I take a look at. Like there's really no big issue with coffee, but anything in excess, I think is a signal for us to take a deeper look at. Mm. Hot tips right there. How do you feel like science has evolved and where do you think it's actually going in terms of either nutrition working out or all of the above yeah I mean it's continuously evolving we're only getting smarter and better at research and um, I think it's going to continue to grow and change um, I think very foundational things are not going to change like if you eat mostly plants like that's a good thing um, mm -hmm. Not to say you don't have to exclude meat. Like, that's what I thought. You have to go to the extreme. It's just making sure that, you know, like I said, if you use that plate method, you're pretty on, on target. Um, but in regards to, like, the way the science is changing, um, I think we have to be careful because there is a lot of emerging research in things like probiotics and prebiotics and um even um, get people being able to take, like, a DNA test to see if they sh should be more you know, low fat diet or high carb or low carb or like high protein and all of that. And so there's a lot of like testing kits out there. Oh, allergy testing as well. Um, these like toolkits that people are spending like two to $300 on mm -hmm. to be told that like they need to exclude this and to eat that and all that. And to be honest, I think it's a waste of money because the science just isn't there yet. So although it's coming, Mm -hmm. it's not there yet and then you also have to argue like how does that help somebody in their lifestyle like if you have if you're told you're pre-diabetic like do you really need a dna 250 dollars dna test to tell you that you need to watch your sugar intake <laughs> yeah i don't think so um, but that's a whole sidebar so anyways i do feel like all that stuff is coming i would just say be careful right now because a lot of that stuff that's being promoted like it's just the science not there yet um and you know, it will be, but at the end of the day, like most people are missing the very foundational things, more sleep, more water, more rest, more work. So it's, it's interesting. So you have like the extreme exercisers that never give themselves a day off. And then mm -hmm. you have the people that barely, you know, get off the couch and neither one is good or bad. It's just, it's the reality. And we need to find that middle, you know, you need to find that middle. And so I think like that stuff, regardless of where the research goes and what it shows, like if you're prioritizing, you know, your self care um, and your needs and you're setting boundaries and you're honoring them and you're living a, like a less stressed out lifestyle, then I think you're going to be pretty healthy and okay. And I don't think it matters what the research says, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. And on that train of 
like what is a common myth that about either nutrition or working out that you want to debunk and you want everyone to know? Oh God, there's so many. <laughs> there's so many. You can uh, pick, a, pick a few maybe. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Well, with exercise. So I'm, as like I said, I'm a dietitian, but I, um, so I talk about exercise, but it's not technically like my specialty, but I will say that a lot of people have this perception that they need to work out a certain amount of hours, a certain amount of days and all of that. But really the best workout is the one that you enjoy because like anything you, if you like the results it's giving you, you're going to have to keep putting the same amount of effort to get that in return. Okay. So that goes to your nutrition plan, to your exercise plan. So with your exercise, like it's okay to change it up. Like if you love Zumba one day and you love kickboxing the next day and you like strength training the next day, it's okay. But if you only like biking, that's okay. I mean, variety in your workouts is, is beneficial, but do you do the thing that you love? You don't have, this is the myth. You don't have to break a sweat and kill yourself every time you work out for it to be considerably like it work out, like a workout that counts. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me, I just worked out for 20 minutes, I reframe that to say to them, wow, you made use of the 20 minutes that you had. You made use of the little time that you had, like good for you. Imagine if we all worked out for quote unquote, just 20 minutes, three to four days a week, rather than like going balls to the walls for a day or two, and then never working out again for another month or so. Like, Mm -hmm we would all be healthier beings because it's not about doing it to look a certain way. It's about doing it to feel a certain way. And because our bodies are meant to move, we're mammals. And so we do need to move, but it's finding a movement that you enjoy. So if you like yoga, do yoga. If you like swimming, you know, do swimming. If you like biking, do biking, whatever it is that you enjoy, that's going to be the best exercise program for you. And the same goes with your nutrition. There's not one size fits all approach. Um, they're really the one thing I will say is that if you are feeling super restricted on it and you feel fear from knowing what to eat or where to eat or what to have or how much to have, Mm -hmm. that's an issue. That's not normal. That is not normal. And I think today it's normal to be like, Oh, I'm not eating any carbs. I'm not eating carbs or I'm not eating after 6 PM or whatever it is. And it's like, If that works for you, great, but neglecting whole food groups, whole macronutrients, like all carbohydrates, like that is not going to be helpful for you in the long run. So learn how to incorporate them, but incorporate them in a balanced way so that way you can enjoy like family dinners if you're Italian like me and you have pasta on Sundays or whatever it is, like you want that, that's important to you. So why diet it away? Like why not Mm -hmm. embrace it and learn how to make it work with your lifestyle? You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Who is someone in either the industry or just in your life that inspires you? So it's not really related to like nutrition or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I will say that my father is somebody that I always talk about who I really love and admire because he just didn't have um, the he, would, he grew up poor because unfortunately his father basically stayed in Italy and sent him to America with um, my grandmother. But my grandmother passed away when my father was five. And then his father never took him in. So basically my father grew up as an orphan. Um, Fortunately, the family that ended up taking him over was his babysitter who, so now my aunts, my uncles, my cousins that I call my aunts and uncles, my cousins, they're not actually blood related. Um, But all that to say, he grew up poor. They didn't have a lot of money. He didn't grow up with a mother or a father. Um, It was hard for him. And Mm -hmm. he made the best for himself in his life. And he ended up, you know, marrying my mom and then having me and my sister. And me and my sister never, never really, we're very blessed. Like, we never really needed anything. Um, He took care of us. And he did that on purpose because he knew what it was like to not have. Mm -hmm. And so he worked really, really hard to make sure that we could have the lifestyle that we could, I could go to college and I didn't have to worry or stress. And I understand my privilege and I'm very grateful for that. And it's because of him that I can do what I'm doing today. If he didn't set that up for me, it would have been really hard for me to get here. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm grateful for him. He inspires me. Um, And he's the reason why I work so hard because he's about to get ready to retire. So like, I want to be able to give back to him what he gave to me. 
Oh, that's so beautiful. Congrats to him for um, like getting closer to retirement and getting to enjoy all the work that he's put in. And hopefully once this blows over, he gets to really enjoy that. You had said something before about, um, you know, tying your your weight to your worth, that idea of having like a number on a scale, right? Or like thinking like, if I am look a certain way, I'll be happier. And that isn't the case. And it is very, it's in a very um, emotional and personal journey each person can go to. And why do you believe that is? Oh, why? I mean, I think that oh, there's so many things. I mean, I think it's what we see. Mm -hmm. So um, in my book, I talk about, you know, sitting in the hair salon with my mom, like waiting for her to get done and like flipping through magazines and like on the very cover, it teach tells you like lose 10 pounds in 10 days. Like mm -hmm. um, how, you know, Brittany got her, it, de Justin's attention or whatever, like back in the day, like I grew up in the nineties. So, yeah. you know, it was when like boy bands were popular mm -hmm. and like Christina Aguilera was like, you know, it was where people started to get a little risky. They were starting to show their bellies, but it was like, who was allowed to show their bellies because those who were overweight and show, they got a, you know, the paparazzi came around and just like, like, Oh, this person let themselves go, you know, like, and that's just like the things that we were, we were seeing. And then also mm -hmm. if you look at like Disney and Disney, uh, think about like Ursula, right? So think about all of the people in Disney that are not the princesses mm -hmm. and that they're either evil or they're just not the main character. Right. They're overweight. We've been told this since we were children mm -hmm. that if you are not a Barbie size figure, you cannot be the star of the show. Yeah. Right. And so it starts way early in our childhood. Um, but then I think also too going to the doctor mm -hmm. and getting on the scale. And I hated going to the, getting on the scale in the doctor because I was always reminded that I was in the 95th percentile. Mm. So I was always bigger. They never mentioned that it's because I was also taller, but it doesn't matter. But the mm -hmm. point is, it doesn't matter. Right. The fact is, is that you are made to feel less than or like a disappointment for being bigger than you at nine or eight years old. Like, mm -hmm. if anything, like I was just a product of my environment. So it's not to blame my parents or anything like that. But and I love my father. I really do. But like, mm -hmm. what did we do after dinner? We would sit on the couch and bond and ate lots of ice cream. There's nothing wrong with that. And mm -hmm. I see that now. But like, that's the only connections I could draw. Right. It's like. You know, we would go and I would go to McDonald's and I would get, a, you know, a 20 piece chicken nugget. I would get a, a Big Mac and I would get, you know, the large fry. And I loved it. And I and I did, never thought twice about it. But like the idea, the, con the idea is that like we are just a product of our environment. So mm -hmm. both from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint. Um, and so I think we are just taught very early on that the number on the scale matters, but um, I've learned now that it actually doesn't. What matters most is your view of yourself, the way that you take care of yourself, um, like I said, and the physical and mental health aligned. Like, I just wrote a post recently. It's actually a segment from my book about how I got caught up. I, like about a few years ago, I had lost like 30 pounds and it was intentional. And you know, as an RD with all this knowledge, I'm like, oh, what's five more pounds? What's five more pounds? Oh, if mm -hmm. I just get to the BMI, that's quote unquote normal. I'll feel like I achieved like my whole life. I've always been in the overweight category. Like it would be amazing if I can get to quote unquote normal, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to stop. I actually got sick. So I had to stop. I had no choice, but mm -hmm. basically like it's very easy to get caught up in that. And it's, you, we have to just be better at recognizing that what's actually healthy is when both our physical health and our mental health align. Just to kind of put this full circle, once I moved out, it was really like starting to plan how I cook meals, how I do this, how I do that. And I actually never bought a scale because I realized just growing up, it just wasn't a healthy habit for me. I'm so excited we had an opportunity to talk because that relatability, um, it just like it really just drives like what you do. And I, I love that. Yay. Well, thank you. And I'm proud of you. That's awesome. 
Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't need a scale. You know in your body, you know in your clothes, you know in yourself if you're doing what you need to do to take care of you. I had surgery earlier this year and I uh, it was it was not good for the fact that like what was happening. So I got my gallbladder taken out when you go through those episodes. I don't know if you're familiar with how the episodes happen. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, I have, I actually have a client who's struggling with that right now, actually. Um, yeah. So she'll probably have to get hers out as well. Yeah. And so those could be triggered by a plethora of things. It's like stress. It's like, you know, they look at your like they ask you a, a list of like, what do you eat and try to determine all these different factors. But um. I remember sitting in the doctor's office and just being like, like saying what I eat. And she even said like, oh, you like, it doesn't seem like you have to really change anything. And really uh, what it came down to was also the stress. And so it was like more of like, you need to sleep more. Like I had to be like, you need to go like the. It's so funny because we like a lot of people love sleep, right? You want to sleep in all this stuff. But it's always the hardest thing to just get to that point where you go to sleep, put away your laptop, put away your work, you know, like all these things. And because sleep is really that important. It is so important. I, I don't even know if I'm making sense right now because I'm You're just making- kind of talking off of my brain. But I'm just like, sleep is important. <laughs> no, but it is so important. It is. It really is. And like, yeah, I mean, what you eat and how you exercise, like it part of the equation but it's not all the equation and that's what's miscon like that's the misconception that's what people think is healthy you know it's just eating you know veggies and grilled chicken so what what's next for you um well hopefully i can finish this book so (laughs) it is a process um but it's almost done. It's in the final editing stages. I've just learned Yay. to um, just accept it's going to take longer than I anticipated. <laughs> All good things do, though. All good things do. It's going to yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. So that's honestly, that's that's the next big thing. Like, it will be out this year. Excuse me. For sure. Like, it will definitely be out this year. Um, we wanted it to be out last year, but, you know. The pandemic, but um, <laughs> so, but it'll it'll be out this year, um, and then from there, I don't know. Like, I want, like, I, I, I'm excited to hire two RDs because I think it's going to help me be able to show up on social media more, be on you know more podcasts, and just get my message out there. So, I'm amazing. Yes. And where can everyone find you that want to follow along with your journey? Uh, sure. You can follow me on Instagram is where I'm super heavy at tips underscore with underscore Tony with an I. I also have my own podcast called the Tips with Tony podcast. Um, or you can go to my website if you're interested in working with me one on one. I'm going to start opening up um, availability for my one to one coaching. I have a couple people graduating next week. So you can go to www.tipswithtony.com slash coaching. Amazing. Um, anything else you want to say? Um, I just hope that this gave you some insight. It got you to think about things a little differently. Um, practice small changes. Try to get out of that all or nothing mindset. I know it's a slow process, but I promise you, slow changes, real change. And what you're doing now is really just keeping you back, you know, where you were like it's not going to help in any way so if you really want to do something different you want a different outcome you're going to have to stop focusing on this all or nothing like these big grandiose changes and really just focus on what's one little thing that I can implement today that's going to make me feel better amazing Thank you so much for your time, for all your knowledge. This has been absolutely incredible. Your story is so beautiful and I've enjoyed getting to know you more and getting (laughs) the story more. Very motivating. Very motivating. Thank you so much. And with that, everybody, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If this resonated with you in any way, please let us know. Take a screenshot of this episode, share it on your story, tag me at tips underscore with underscore Tony. That's Tony with an I. Also, you can also find me on Instagram at the Tips with Tony podcast. And you can find Mel at Unpacking Stories 
on Instagram as well. And so take a screenshot of it, share it on your story, and let us know what resonated with you and if you enjoyed it, if it inspired you, if it kind of helped you kind of see things in a different light, um, that would be amazing. We would really appreciate just letting us know that we made an impact on you. It's, it's why we do these for free. That's <laughs> why we do this because we're just really, really passionate about spreading awareness, spreading inspiration. Um, her podcast is incredible. So definitely go subscribe, listen to other people's stories. They're really, really magical. All right, that is it for me today. Thank you so much for listening. If you're not already subscribed to the Tips with Tony podcast, definitely hit that subscribe button. A new episode comes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And when you're subscribed, you do not miss a beat. All right, that is it for me today. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Tony Marinucci, your registered dietitian, helping you get healthy one bite at a time.